Good afternoon and welcome to the Authors Hour. My name is Fred Zarm. I represent the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. We are a volunteer organization that aims to support and supplement the official activities of the institution's Chautauqua Writers Center, uh, both by assisting with some of their workshops, but also by providing some events of our own. And the Authors Hour is the event of the day. Um, at halftime, I'll be back with more information about the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. But right now, we want to get to our first reader. Sabina Rachman is the author of the memoir, Threading My Prayer Rug, One Woman's Journey from Pakistani Muslim to American Muslim. And the theme for today is, in some ways, what it means to be a Muslim American. Okay? The book was shortlisted for the 2018 William Saroyan International Prize for Writing, received honorable mention in spirituality by the San Francisco Book Festival Awards 2017, and was listed as a top 10 religion and spirituality book 2016, and also top 10 diverse nonfiction book 2017 by Booklist. Excerpts from her memoir were featured in the Wall Street Journal and Salon.com. She is an op-ed contributor to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Daily News. Ms. Rockman migrated from Pakistan in 1971 after a hurried arranged marriage that has worked out marvelously to a Pakistani doctor in New York. She has had a 25 year career as a hospital executive. In the 1980s, she began um, the work of establishing a Muslim community on Staten Island, which culminated in the building of a mosque. She is the co-founder of the National Autism Association, New York Metro chapter. As a public speaker, she has spent several decades engaging in interfaith dialogue. She has given 240 talks and counting in 81 cities at houses of worship, academic institutions, and community organizations, including the Chautauqua Institution. She blogs on topics related to the theme of her book at sabihahrockman.com slash blog. Her next book, which she has co-authored with Walter Ruby, is entitled, We Refuse to Be Enemies, How Muslims and Jews Can Make Peace One Friendship at a Time. It'll be published by RK Publishing in spring 2021. And I believe you can uh, log in and at Barnes and Noble and do a pre-sale order. Ms. Rockman lives in New York City with her husband, Khaled. Sabiha, take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you, Fred, for that uh, introduction. Thank you, all of you, uh, for joining uh, on this uh, afternoon at the Author's Hour. So as Fred said, I did come to the United States in 1971 after a hurried arranged marriage. And I'll read a bit from my opening chapter called It's Arranged. You're getting married, mommy announced. I was at the College for Women in between my postgraduate English literature classes, hanging out with my friends. Mummy had tracked me down. Your fiance has arrived from New York, she said. He has to return to America in two weeks, so you are taking off. Let's go. I have to take you to the tailor to have your wedding outfit stitched. I had gotten engaged a few weeks ago. A wedding date had not been talked about, but it seemed like it was in the distant future. But now my fiance had come to Pakistan all the way from New York, so I had to get married. And that was that. So I got into the car with my mom and she drove me to the tailors and on my way I am daydreaming. Oh, so my fiance is here. I wonder what it'll be like to see him for the first time. Will I be too nervous to talk to him? And I wonder what his voice is like. 
and oh please God, let him be taller than me in high heels. It had all started when my future prospective mother-in-law-to-be had come visiting, asking for my hand in marriage for her son who was a doctor in New York. I served her and my mother tea in the sunroom and after that I withdrew into my bedroom and let them talk in private because I'm not supposed to know what's going on. And even though everybody knew that I know what's going on, I'm not supposed to know what's going on. After a while, my mother walked in and in her hand, she had a yellow envelope and in it were the photos of the suitable boy. And she showed them to me. And there he was standing in his corduroy jacket in front of the uh, Washington Memorial. And then there the cherry blossoms in the background. And he was a good looking guy. And that is all I could tell was that he was a good looking guy. Now in Pakistan, arranged marriages is everybody's business. So as soon as word got out that my future prospective mother-in-law to be was visiting, the whole extended family descended on our home. My parents, my grandparents, both sides, my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, friends of friends, they all assembled and they were peppering my future mother-in-law to be with all kinds of questions about her son in New York. When she left, they all gathered again. That evening, the extended family convened again and had the likes of a round table meeting. The agenda? To accept or not accept the marriage proposal. He is a doctor. Plus, New York is too far away. Minus. The grandparents know the family very well. Plus, Grandparents have a lot of, carry a lot of weight and have a lot of say in that culture. They say he has a very good temperament, is very responsible, is very caring. Plus, but we haven't seen him. Minus. What if he decides to settle in America and not return to Pakistan? Huge minus. No one has seen him since to, he went to America over two years ago. Has America changed him? Plus, minus. And where was I in all these discussions? Right in the middle, listening, but also listening to my inner voice. Khalid's proposal felt right. How irrational is that? I just had the feeling that this proposal was right for me. But I said nothing. I had not learned to trust my instincts and I respected my parents' apprehension. So one thing led to the other. My mother did her due diligence, did all the background checks, almost like an FBI investigation, came out with 10 star reviews and it's, it's, all, in, it's all in my book. And uh, I got married. He had come, I got married, I got on a plane, flew all the way west, landed at JFK airport on a cold, wintry, dreary, rainy December morning and life never looked so bright. I was in love. The, in fact, the first time I had spoken to my husband was on my wedding night and I was in love. As soon as we got home, it was dinner time. My husband took me for a loop. He made dinner. Now understand that in the Pakistani culture, the kitchen is a no man's land. I don't think that my father ever held a potato. And as I saw my Prince Charming peeling away the layers of the onion, I just fell in love all over again. I quickly settled down after many, many culture shocks, which I talk about in my book, I settled down into the life of a homemaker and had two boys. In the first few years, I drifted away from the faith. I was raised Muslim. And it wasn't because I was too busy, which I was, but the environment wasn't there. This was the early 70s. There were no mosques, no Islamic centers, no Muslim communities. 
and really no Muslims around me. And so I stopped saying my prayers. I folded away my prayer rug. Ramadan came and went. And the communal spirit that comes with opening your fast every evening with the community was just not there. So I stopped fasting. And it was only when my children started growing up, our children, and we started getting worried that what if they lose the faith, that we really woke up to the fact that we need to do something. At the same time, my husband and I had a dilemma. To what extent do we assimilate that we don't lose the richness of the culture that we brought with us from the home country? So for example, on the Eid holiday, what if schools are open? Do I keep my children home from school? What if they have an exam? What if my husband has patients scheduled? What if I have a board meeting? And will my boys have an arranged marriage just like mommy and daddy? And do I get them a Christmas tree? And while we were dealing with that, these dilemmas, I also didn't know how to teach my children about the faith because I had grown up in a secular country. Even though Pakistan was Muslim majority, I went to a Catholic school for my schooling, started my day with the Lord's Prayer, and I knew next to nothing about the faith. I had read the Quran in Arabic from the beginning to the end, but the fact, and with that, my religious education was considered complete. The fact that I didn't know a word of what I was reading, I couldn't understand the language, was considered inconsequential. So I grew up strong in faith, but totally lacking in the knowledge. I then remember, and there were no books, there were no teachers. But then I remembered that my grandparents used to tell me stories, bedtime stories, which were stories of the prophets, Abraham, Noah, Jesus, Jesus Joseph, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all. And that's where I got my moral grounding from. So I went looking for stories in the bookstore and in the children's section, I found a book titled Stories from the Bible. I looked in it and it had all the stories that are in the Quran. Only Prophet Muhammad was missing, so I figured I'd wing that. And so every morning I'd sit with both the boys on each side on the sofa and bedtime stories became daytime stories. But as they started growing up, that wasn't enough. They needed a community, they needed a center, they needed a mosque, something they could belong to and feel proud of. They saw their Christian friends going to church, they saw their Jewish friends going to the synagogue. They needed to feel a sense of belonging. We didn't know where to start. So we went through the yellow pages, looking for Muslim sounding names, found two who knew two, who knew four, and all of a sudden we had a critical mass and decided to rent a place and start a Sunday school for the children. The problem was there were no teachers. So guess what? We became teachers. We had to educate ourselves and constantly stay one step ahead of our children because they were asking questions we never asked our parents because we grew up in a Muslim society. So there was really no challenges, no need to learn, no need to inquire. In fact, had we stayed in Pakistan, we would never have learned as much as we learned about our faith because we were living here. Then we established a mosque. That's a whole other story, which I detail in the book. But what's interesting is that once the children started going to Sunday school, they brought us back into the faith. So one day, my son, Saqib, came home and said, Mommy, it's prayer time. Aren't you going to pray? Yes, let's get out those prayer rugs. Mommy, it's Ramadan tomorrow. Aren't you going to fast? Yeah, sure. Sure, we're going to fast. Okay, honey, vacation's over, start fasting. And then our children grew up. And now the question was, who are they going to get married to? And of course, we all wanted them to marry in the faith, but it doesn't always work out that way. And all I can say is that when, that with my first son, 
older one, I did not arrange his marriage. I engineered it. And that's all in the book as well. But here's what happened. When we opened the doors of our mosque, we, we had people coming from all different ethnicities and countries of origin. So you had the indigenous African Americans, you had the white Af Americans, you had Pakistani, Indian, Turkish, uh, European, African, Indonesian. Everybody was practicing the faith differently. And everybody believed that their faith was the right way and that the other didn't know what they were doing. And that's when my husband and I realized that so much of what we practice is a consequence of our culture and our tradition. And we erroneously attribute it to the faith. Now, what about our children? They are Americans. They are going to have to express their faith within an American culture. And how do we do that? So we went back to the scriptures took what was theological, separated it from what was cultural, and took the theology and wrapped it in the colors of red, white, and blue. Our children did it organically. We parents had to do it deliberately. And what our children are now expressing, and of course my children are, are now parents of children, but they are expressing an American Muslim identity an identity that is wholly American and wholly Muslim. And by that I mean is that there are some things that have changed and there are some things that have not changed. What has not changed are the core values, the belief in the one God, five prayers a day, fasting during Ramadan, giving to charity, making the Hajj to the house that Abraham built, the patriarch of all religions, to remind us that we are all children of the same patriarch. What has changed is how they express it. Their language, their music, their, their clothing. But interestingly, weddings are a, are a big thing. And in Pakistan, when I got married, I wore red because that was the tradition. Here, the women are wearing white, nothing un-Islamic about it. Uh, I walked down the aisle on, on my Mother's arm, that was the tradition. Here they walked down the aisle on dad's arm. Very American, nothing un-Islamic about that. But women are not giving up their maiden name. Now I was Sabiha Akbar and I became Sabiha Rahman, not because it was the Islamic way, which it wasn't, but because it was the British way. Pakistan was a British colony and this was a legacy that they left behind. And we took it on and Somewhere along the line, it became a religious thing. But women here who have now studied the religion are saying it says in the Quran, go by your father's name. So they are keeping their maiden name. Very Islamic, very American. There will be Christmas trees. We believe in the birth of Jesus Christ. There will be interfaith couples. We believe and the Quran gives permission to marry people of the book. How we give thanks has changed. In Pakistan, we used to distribute sweets in single packet servings to all our neighbors when we had something to give thanks for. Now we have Thanksgiving, we have Mother's Day, we have Father's Day. The role of the man who holds the mic has changed. And by that, I mean the religious leaders, also fast becoming the women who holds the mic. Uh, when we started our mosque, we had to import the imam from the old country because we didn't have any imams here. They didn't speak the language. Our children couldn't relate to them. They didn't know the culture. Now we have homegrown institutions and seminaries that are training American-born men and women to become spiritual leaders. But the thing that has changed the most has been the woman's role. In the old country, women do not go to the mosque. It's just a man's thing. Here, we are involved in building the mosque, in the fundraising, sitting on the boards, uh, determining the schedule and the uh, curriculum, all of that, uh, playing a very vital role. So which is all very American and very Islamic. Then 9-11 happened. And the image of Muslims being portrayed in the media was painful. 
And at that time, we had to shift our focus from being from doing in reach, building Muslim community to doing outreach. And that's when we got engaged in interfaith dialogue. And then something happened that changed my life, our life actually. Our grandson, Umar, was detained at the airport. He was 10 years old, he was eight years old. He has autism, but he got detained because his name was the same as a terrorist on the no-fly list. They were going to Disney World, they missed their flight, they were put in holding, no one allowed them to go out and get food for him. He started stimming. I was calling the press. I was calling our congressmen, our assemblymen. Nobody could help until they came back and said, well, we did a match and the terrorist is in his 20s, so he, he can go. And that's when my husband started saying, it's not enough that we are doing interfaith dialogue. We have to make ourselves known by telling our stories. So you've got to write this book. And that's when I decided to write this book to make ourselves known because I want the reader to know that the heart and soul of a Muslim mother is like that of any other. And that Islam does not oppress women, misguided people do. That Islam does not advocate violence, misguided people do. And that the Islamic values are entirely compatible with the American values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I also want the reader to know by re reading my stories that we are not a monolith. We are not a one size fits all. We are not profilable. The hijab and beard does not define us. The country of birth does not define us. The color of our skin does not define us. We are all children of the same God. And also because I don't want my grandchildren to be afraid to say I am a Muslim. So my appeal to you is as I have told you some of my stories, please read my book and share these stories with your friends. Consider giving this book as a gift to your friends. I also narrated it in Audible. And thank you for listening. And thank you very much, Biha. Thank you. Although I've told you, heard you multiple times, I always hear something new and fresh in, in what you present. On chat near the top, I put some links to Sabiha's books. I'm also going to try to give you a better view of the cover here. So that's the very, very nice, very impressive cover to her book. And as she mentioned, she has another book coming out in the near future. I um, wanted to say just a few more things. Well, first of all, thanks to Sabia again. I um, wanted to mention a few more things about the Friends of the Writer Center and some of our events. Um, on chat, I put a couple things. One is a link to our YouTube channel. Um, this author's hour and all the author's hours are available at that, on that channel. Um, this video probably won't get there until this evening, perhaps, but, but it'll be there. Um, another past event is there as well, our Robert Pinsky Favorite Poem Project, where Chautauquans read their favorite published poem and explain wh why it means so much to them. That happened a couple weeks ago, and it's up on YouTube as well. Um, next week, the Author's Hour will consist of poet Judith Bowles reading primarily from her most recent book, Unlocatable Source, and memoirist Larry I. Palmer will be reading from his memoir, um, Scholarship Boy, Meditations on Family and Race. Um, I've heard Judith read at Politics and Prose in DC, fine poet. And I just finished Larry's book and I highly recommend it. Um, the one other thing uh, we sponsor, the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center, is the weekly um, open mic at five o'clock. If you go to the general link, www.chq.org slash FCWC, 
you can find a Zoom link to open mic. Anyone 18 or older is welcome to present or just listen. And the one other special event I almost forgot is that we do sponsor an annual writing contest. And at 6.15 this Sunday, the awards will be presented on Zoom. We'll record that. It'll be available later on YouTube as well. And once again, if you go to our web page and go down to writing contest, you can find a link for that. Okay, enough from me. Now we'll get to our second reader of the afternoon, Dr. Debbie Almentazer. She was the founding and former principal of the Cahill Gibran International School in Brooklyn, New York. That's the first Arabic dual language public school in the United States. A 25-year veteran of the New York City public school system, she taught and served as a director in special education and inclusion, trained teachers in literacy, and served as a multicultural specialist and diversity advisor. Currently, she is the founder and CEO of the Bridging Cultures Group Incorporated and a professor at the College of Staten Island School of Education in the Postmaster's Advanced Certificate Program for Leadership in Education. Dr. Almentazer was a featured speaker at the 2016 National Democratic Convention and has been featured on the front page of the New York Times and profiled in Time Magazine, Newsweek, and The Daily News. We're fortunate enough to have her with us here this afternoon, Dr. Debbie Almentazer. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you and to actually be sharing the platform with my dear friend um, and my sister and one of my mentors, Sabiha. Um, I have heard her speak about her book um, a number of times, and I just always feel so inspired um, by her presentation. So may Allah bless you, Sister Sabiha, for your great work and your storytelling, your art of storytelling. Um, I, you know, what I'm going to share with you is my book um, titled Leading While Muslim. Um, by the way, what you see behind me is not my book. Someone thought it was, but it's not. And being that I do so many Zoom calls, I've decided to have this behind me to help people just feel a little more cheerful. And um, because, you know, the, the Zoom world uh, is very uh, boring and uh, sometimes overwhelming. So I hope any of those words on there will inspire you. The story of my book um, is one that's also very unique um, and from my own personal experience uh, in terms of how the book came about. I was inspired by my own personal experience as an American Muslim school leader um, who set out to open the first Arabic dual language public school and never in my wildest dreams um, see myself being you know, at the bull's eye of a controversy that was fueled by Islamophobia. Um, and then seeing how I was treated and things that happened to me, I wanted to see whether or not other school leaders who are American Muslim working in public education faced any uh, adversity as school leaders or for that matter as teachers when they first started their careers. Um, and so I ventured um, in my PhD program to really look at the lived experiences of American Muslim school leaders in public education to find out, you know, whether the political discourse that we hear every day about Islam and Muslims, the unfortunate global events that happen in the name of Islam by people who don't represent the pure authentic Islam that I and Sabiha adhere to, um, and whether or not the media coverage of Islam and Muslims is affecting their leadership and their spirituality. And the reason that I wanted to know whether or not, you know, these things were affecting their spirituality is because we live in a time that Islamophobia has dictated how people perceive Islam and Muslims. And I wanted to know if they were 
exercising their spirituality, if they were freely talking about their spirituality. And sadly, as I dug deep into this research, um, I found that the majority of them would never wanted to talk about their spirituality, never divulge whether they were observant or not. Um, and it was a really sad moment to see um, that this was something that they felt, you know, in some cases, some of the uh, subjects had to hide whether or not they were actually observant Muslims. So um, the study was not very easy to do. Um, first and foremost, I was not able to find enough um, participants in New York City to actually be able to uh, do this, you know, deep qualitative um, study. And so what I had to do was actually look nationally um, and finding um, school leaders in public education um, across the United States was very difficult. Um, it took me over six months to actually track down 20 people who came by word of mouth um, and then other people recommending them or their local mosque knew that there was an, uh, you know, a school leader. Um, so out of the 20 people, I only was able to engage um, 14 to actually participate in the study. The other six um, were very, very um, concerned about their identities being revealed because they were the only ones in their school district um, or for that matter, um, even in their you know, state. Um, and so no matter how much I try to convince them that their identities will never be revealed, their city and state will never be revealed, um, it was just very difficult for them. And it was because their experiences were so unique that they felt that they could be easily identified. So of the 14 people that are in the study, um, it was actually six men um, and eight women. Uh, and then in terms of the demographics of the, um, the school leaders, it's really fascinating. Six of them um, were actually African-American, um, three uh, women um, and three men who participated. Um, and then the others um, were actually uh, of Arab American background, um, Yemeni, uh, Palestinian, Egyptian, Syrian, um, and then two, uh, two of those people of the 14 were actually of South Asian background. One who was a pack of uh, Indian background, born in Tanzania um, and migrated to the US, and then one was actually uh, Pakistani. And so as I um, delved into the research to really understand their lived experiences, the themes that emerged um, in the study were the following. Um, and what I did, I should step back, um, it was a phenomenological study, and I used political spectacle as the conceptual framework to look at their lived experiences. Um, and this political spectacle uh, framework was developed by Murray Edelman, where he basically saw every, um, you know, every incident that ever happened, you know, um, and, and actually became uh, something that made uh, the news or uh, what have you as a political spectacle. And he believed that um, a political spectacle has the protagonist and the antagonist. And what we see here, you know, for these American school leaders, um, is, um, you know, they were sadly, um, you know, always at the receiving end of Islamophobia, whether it was from their school community, parents, their superiors, their colleagues. Um, and so that was always the way that I looked at this particular um, incident in, in each of their lives. So the emerging um, themes that came out of this study was um, many of them talked about the political climate um, and how they felt uh, in terms of, um, you know, being uh, always at the center because of their Muslim faith, especially the women. Now, I had mentioned that there were more women than men. The number of women that were actually wearing headscarf were very easily identifiable, right, because of the fact that they have a headscarf. 
Others who didn't wear the scarf, really people couldn't very much tell unless they revealed their identity. Um, and you know, in, in one of those instances, one of the women used to wear a hijab when she was a teacher, um, and then came to the conclusion of if she wanted to become a school leader, she had to make some concessions to, to reach that level. Um, and so the, you know, I look at their experiences pre 9-11 and post 9-11 to see how any, how things have changed. And so for example, um, you know, Nejla, who was a school teacher, wore the hijab and her aspiration as she was actually, um, you know, learning to, to be a teacher and to be a staff developer, she got into a program to become um, an administrator. And at the end of that program, one of her professors basically said to her, you know, if you really want to um, become a school leader one day, you're really gonna have to think about um, basically changing your wardrobe. What does this mean, change your wardrobe? It was basically a subtle way of saying, you really need to take that headscarf off if you wanna be considered. Um, and so Nedula had to make that unfortunate sacrifice of either she continues to, to show her observance as a Muslim or to follow her aspirations in a post 9-11 world to become a school leader. And sadly, she had to make that sacrifice to take off the hijab in order for her to excel um, in her career. And sadly, as you know, she talked about her spirituality, um, she always felt a sense of regret for doing it um, um, and, and hoped and prayed that one day she was gonna be able to build the courage to actually wear the hijab and go to work. Um, but because of the political climate, you know, that continues to, you know, dictate the times of our, our lives, um, she doesn't, you know, she didn't seem to think it was going to happen anytime soon. Um, you know, taking a step back in terms of like, I'm actually the first person to look at this population of school leaders in public education. And when um, I started the research uh, to put my literature review together, I found no literature written about American Muslim school leaders in public education. So I actually had to look at the experiences of other communities. And the two communities that um, had a lot of parallel um, to, to share um, and to build a foundation was actually the Catholic experience and the Jewish experience when they first migrated to the United States, um, you know, and, and the experiences that they felt, the adversity, the discrimination, the anti-Semitism. It was really um, astonishing to see some of the things that happened to these two communities and then seeing them playing out with the American Muslim community um, in the last, you know, 30 years. And looking at the experiences of those two communities really gave me hope because we see the two communities now fully integrated into American society um, and also um, having a place at the table. And so, you know, even though that right now anti-Semitism um, is, is at a, you know, at a very high rate, um, the community has really fully integrated and is able to advocate for itself. And so it gave me hope to see that my community will eventually develop that opportunity to be able to, um, to you know, overcome those challenges. Um, and then the other thing that was really important for me, um, at, you know, in, in my literature review to uh, highlight was also the history of Islam in America. Um, you know, in the context of Islamophobia, Islam has been um, viewed through the lens of an immigrant religion, um, not seen as a religion that has actually had, you know, roots in the United States um, that make it, um, you know, known and um, a part of the American fabric. And um, I'll just read, you know, a, a really uh, brief piece from the book that highlights, you know, the history of Islam uh, in America. The presence of Muslims in the United States dates back to the early 1500s. 
In the early, in the year of 1528, a slave named Estevanco from Morocco was shipwrecked with Spanish explorers in what is known today as Texas. Following that, the first great wave of Muslims entering America began from the time of the slave trade. It is estimated that 12 million Africans were brought to North America as slaves and that 20% of that population were Muslim. It is important to note that the migration of African Americans to the United States was very different from Catholics, Jews, and Muslims that came later and other ethnic groups that migrated to the United States. The migration of Africans into the Americas was not one of choice, but of force through slave trade. The presence of African Americans in the United States dates back to 1619, when the first 20 Africans were shipped to Dutch ships, um, were shipped on Dutch ships uh, to Jamestown, Virginia, where they were destined for slavery. The sale of slaves was lucrative among the Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese, who captured and sold slaves in North and South America in the late um, 16th and early 17th century. When I share this with people, they are very surprised to learn and understand the, the roots and history of Islam in America. And sadly, this is because, as I mentioned earlier, um, the way that Islam has been presented um, and the way that, um, you know, it's being seen as an immigrant religion. And so my book really helps people understand that it is not an immigrant religion, but in fact, a religion that has had um, deep roots, um, you know, in the United States, you know, from this nation's inception. Um, and so that was really important. So I'm going to go back to the other um, emerging themes that came out of this study. Um, and then I will read, um, you know, some quotes um, from some of the individuals that um, were in the study to give you a sense of what life was like really for them. So I talked about the political climate um, and then um, the role of the media, many of them feeling inferior and foreign, um, the whole notion of this unconscious fear that they felt um, as school leaders because of their Muslim identity. Um, and then th their spirituality, what that looked like, you know, from one person to another. And then a final, uh, two final findings that I thought were important was education and communication over spectacle, um, where they actually found opportunities to educate people about themselves and about their faith. Um, over, you know, the spectacle that we see. But interestingly, those opportunities were not in their school communities, but were outside of their school communities where they felt more safe to actually speak about their faith and, and identity um, with people who were not associated with public education, which was really fascinating. So um, what I want to do is share with you um, about the role of the media. Um, and one in particular person that I'm going to just highlight of the 14, um, two in particular, is Aziz, who I will share with you what his thoughts were um, about, you know, the role uh, of the media. Um, and then the other person will be Najla, who I'll re reference, you know, later. Um, Aziz describes um, the media as promoting ignorance, promoting the boogeyman. America always has to have a boogeyman. Besides, I'm a Muslim principal. I'm a Muslim teacher. American, America historically has had to have a boogeyman. So people can really uh, rally against him and really be psychologically swayed to think certain ways. So you know, there's a dumbing down of America. They've dumbed down America. They do it through these sound bites and these individuals who really have no political science background or personalities. And they promote that to espouse certain ideas that really promote disunity amongst us all. But I think that, but I think that's the intent 
because if we really start to look at what's really going on, you'll find that you'd that we'd be satisfied more than that sorry that we'd be dissatisfied more than satisfied so i think it's designed to do that and if people can't read in between the lines and be critical and analytical thinkers they're going to believe whatever they hear no matter what the news media promotes i think it's dangerous um you know for aziz an african-american man you know, to give this assessment of the media was really profound. And each and every one of the 14 individuals in the study um, had their own ways of, of actually uh, sharing that. Um, another person um, who, uh, you know, who also lamented on it um, was, was Amen, um, another participant and a man in the book. He, he states, Yes, right now there is Islamophobia and it's soon to be replaced by Chinaphobia or Indiaphobia, any of the above. Whenever the State Department decides that it's time for CNN and MSNBC and Fox News to start focusing their attention on some other rival they want to use to unite the people in the United States and cause a mind shift. It's really interesting how he analyzed um, this was being a state sanctioned um, way of targeting communities. And if we look at the time that we live in right now um, with the Trump administration, many people feel this way. Um, I'm gonna also share with you a quote from Aziz where he talks about um, where you know his inferior and foreign um, complexities actually uh, emerge um, and you know that is something that many of them were feeling not because um, of, of just their identity but were made to feel that way by people um, who they encountered and so in one aspect um, Aziz basically you know with the backdrop of political spectacle the feeling of being inferior and foreign has become internalized for some of the participants. Aziz expresses feeling about the ability to serve as a principal while af being um, African American and Muslim. And this is what he says, you know, in, in, um, in this particular piece on inferior and foreign. I'm shocked that I'm a principal with the last name Mahmoud. I still can't believe it because I didn't think in a post 9-11 era that I would have the opportunity for academic upward mobility. I thought I would be pigeonholed. I thought I would be solely viewed on my last name. To this day, sometimes when people meet me, they say, I expected an older gentleman not looking like you. I don't even tell people I'm a principal. I tell them that I'm a teacher because I don't even believe my view and perception of this system is that I can be gone at any moment. So I don't consider, um, I don't even share, uh, share it with childhood friends. I let them bring it up. I say I'm a teacher. That's the way I address anybody that I meet. And then whoever, whoever is with me may say differently, but I don't even profess it because this could be a fleeting moment in time. Anything can happen at any time. That's how I look at it. That's not a good way to look at things, but I'm realistic in terms of that. I'm black, I'm a black man. I'm a Muslim in America. That's a double-edged sword. So whatever way the sword swings, the head can go. Plus any little mistake you make in this education system could be your last mistake and human nature is to make mistakes it was really hard for me to hear him um talk this way um you know especially as an accomplished um you know educator and uh, a decorated school leader that he feels this way that you know these inferior and foreign um, moments, you know, reside um, inside of him and that he feels this way. 
The other finding that I had mentioned was unconscious fear. And I will read for you, um, you know, Aziz actually lamenting about his unconscious fear. Um, Aziz expressed his position on taking, talking about Islam with members of his school community. And this is what he says. No, I'm not very, I'm never comfortable, never, because that can be misconstrued as if I'm promoting Islam. I've been to a disciplinary hearing before because they thought I was promoting Islam. I don't like sharing any religious conversations or dialogues with my school community unless it's with a teacher and a history class and, there's, and they're talking about religion. Outside of that, I don't speak on it. Even when students come to me and ask me questions, I ask, what do your parents say? Interesting. Well, I defer. I'm not interested in talking about that because I don't want to get slapped on the wrist again. And what Aziz is talking about here is that one school year, he actually had a couple of Muslim school uh, teachers that were working at the school and he allowed them to go make Friday prayer. And he himself also goes. In addition, he also runs, it's a high school. In addition, he also had several high school boys who wanted to go make the Friday prayer. And he followed the protocol of allowing them to leave the school building um, with the parental letter and what have you. And sadly, he was actually reported as promoting Islam because he was walking out of the school building with his Muslim students and walking to the local mosque that was up the street. Um, when he went for this disciplinary hearing, they told him that it was because he was promoting Islam that he should not be walking with his students. And so the disciplinary, at, the uh, at the disciplinary hearing, they told him that he can no longer walk with the students, that they should go on their own, and he should go on their own and have no interaction with those students whatsoever, um, because that was why they uh, brought up the charge of uh, of promoting Islam. So, what a you know what a, a loss it is to those Muslim youth who have this school leader who's a a role model for them, who they can actually connect with. Um, to be disciplined this way. And sadly, what he ended up doing that school year was actually distancing himself from those students. And so it was because of this experience that he felt the necessity um, to make sure that he did not engage in any uh, type of uh, religious activity or discussion. Um, and now I'm gonna just share with you um, a, a quote from Nejla, who actually is one of the women um, that I mentioned earlier, who actually took her headscarf off in order to become a school leader. And what she says um, is, will people listen to me? Will they connect with me? Because I'm thinking that leadership is about connecting. When you think about leadership, initially I was very fragile and I thought about being popular. So will I have people that will like me. And now she's reflecting about if she kept the headscarf, will they really see beyond the headscarf and listen to her and respect her? Um, or is the headscarf um, sadly a hindrance? And she goes on to say, I have a love, I, I have always had a love-hate relationship with the hijab. I always felt strong, confident, and purposeful when I wore the hijab. As a teacher, my students embraced me. Unfortunately, the people, <clears throat> unfortunately, the people closest to me made me feel self-conscious. So while I was a student studying to become a school leader, I took off the hijab. In 2007, when I first began my career as a school administrator, I did believe that the hijab would have a negative impact on my leadership style. I felt that the hijab would distract my staff from listening to what I had to say. Um, again, this was self-imposed on her because of her unconscious fear 
um, of you know being public about her spirituality. Um, <clears throat> And so what I want to do with the, the last few minutes um, is to share with you the findings and the call to action um, that I believe are really important for us to walk away with. Um, you know, when I wrote this book, it wasn't for Muslim audiences, it's for non-Muslim audiences to have a day in the life of a, a leader, right? Yes, there are school leaders, but there are leaders in all different professions um, in all different sectors who are actually experiencing some of these adversities. And as I've gone um, across the country last year doing my book talks, I always had at least one person in every three events that I did that would stay back and share with me uh, an experience that they had in the workplace that was really uh, sad and devastating in some cases. But they had no one to speak to. They didn't know how to deal with these issues. And they felt that my book was the first opportunity for them to talk about them and find ways to address them. So the implications um, for practice or the call to action is the importance of doing more studies on American Muslim educators. I did it on teachers, on, uh, on principals, but we need more um, you know, research done on American Muslim teachers in public education. Um, we need research that provides Muslim educators with the support and encouragement um, to actually excel. Like there have been teachers that I've come across who have been teaching for 25, 30 years and are afraid to go to the next phase of their career because they don't feel supported um, because of their Muslim identity and they don't think they're going to actually be able to be promoted to an administrator because of that. Um, Another important call to action is having workshops focused on Muslims in America to encourage dialogue among um, school communities. There is so much misinformation about Islam and Muslims, and I'm sure many of you over the course of the years have seen reports of teachers using a particular book or um, a lesson that ended up being Islamophobic and ended up making the headlines as being an Islamophobic um, incident. In some cases, it's, it's out of innocence and not knowing anything about Islam and Muslims that it ended up becoming a controversy. And so that's why it's important um, to have workshops for teachers, for administrators, for guidance counselors, to help them understand Islam and Muslims in America especially if they have students from these communities in their school settings. Um, also, it talks about developing curriculum, having curriculum that really helps teachers understand how to teach about Islam and Muslims. What happens in many cases is that teachers find things online and then just utilize that information. But if they had you know, curriculum that was developed by a credible, uh, institute or university that can be actually incorporated into um, their uh, curriculum as you know we have you know Black History Month we have you know Asian History Month we have all of these different you know Hispanic you know History Month um, so making it a point to actually have curriculum and activities that actually can teach you know about you know Islamic history you know um, and Islam in America, because that is important to understand the very people and the very students in our classrooms. Um, another call to action is establishing partnerships with local organizations to invite, you know, for professional development and presentations, whether it's, you know, a local organ, you know, Muslim organization or the local mosque, helping the school community understand um, the importance of, uh, you know, of this community and how to communicate with the community. And then the two last pieces um, really speak to um, American Muslim school leaders is actually establishing a national organization that would provide them support. Um, you know, there is the American Federation of Teachers, there is the, you know, Association for Supervisors, and I engaged in conversation with these school leaders. How would they feel if they had an association that would actually provide them 
um, with uh, the opportunity to create a support group amongst themselves. So the majority of them welcomed it. And then a couple of them who experience unconscious fear to a, a great, you know, uh, a great level, um, they were afraid that if such an organization was online and people saw their names, that they would be victims of Islamophobia, and so really did not want to um, be associated with a formal organization. Unfortunately, um, and then the last piece, which you know. I, is a huge call to action, is creating policies where um, religious um, you know, observances are respected. So here in New York City, um, the entire school system closes for the two Eid holidays. Um, having that become a statewide, having that become national, would actually uh, be a recognition um, of this faith community and to help normalize this community um, you know, that's what we are hoping. And so being able to have that opportunity to have the Muslim holidays, as well as allow both teachers and administrators who are Muslim and observant to be able to go on Friday afternoon to make their prayers at the mosque. Of the six men um, in this study, only two men were actually going to perform their Friday prayers. The other four were too afraid to ask for permission um, because of the, you know, growing Islamophobia, um, and they did not want to be seen as radical or in any way um, put themselves in a vulnerable situation. So the hope is to normalize this by providing them the opportunity for this religious observance. Um, you know, in New York, the Jewish community gets the opportunity on Fridays to leave work early to make sure that they're home before sundown. Um, when I was growing up in upstate Buffalo, I remember on Wednesdays, you know, my public school actually bust all of the Christian children um, for religious services um, at their churches. And then the handful of Muslim students and other students who were not Christian, um, we ended up staying in the classroom for two hours and just played games because the majority of the student body went to church. So, you know, being able to look at what we've done historically um, and then, you know, translate it to our modern time and helping other religious communities be able to observe is really important. So thank you so much. Um, and I, I welcome um, questions uh, during the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Dr. Debbie. Okay. Uh, you. Let me see if I can share your book cover. Which is there and on chat I put, um, even though for some reason the links did not become live, there are a few links to, um, to find out more about your work and to find out how to obtain the books. Or the book. Um, we have just a little bit of time for Q and A. Are there any questions out there, either on chat or through waving your hand? I, I do have one question myself. Have you kept tabs with the participants in that study? Yes, I have. I actually. Um... Uh, so after the book was published and I was on book tour um, nationally, um, I, I was able to visit some of those cities and I gave them a signed copy. I checked in with them mm -hmm. um, and they're really all in a good place, um, which was really, really wonderful. That's neat. Uh, do you have an anecdotal sense, at least, whether things have gotten worse since 2016? You say they're in a good place, but... Is there more anti-Islamic feelings out there? Absolutely. So, you know, I wrapped up uh, the final interviews in the spring of 2016, and they all were terrified by the, you know, uh, campaign run of Donald Trump and making the promise that there was going to be a complete Muslim shutdown. So they were all very nervous about the Muslim ban. Um, one of, the, um, one of the, the individuals within this study, actually two people from within this study, 
were, are actually from two of the Muslim banned countries, Yemen and Syria. Um, and so when I did meet with them and, and talk with them, they could not believe uh, what was happening. Um, but when I say they're in a good place, they're still in their positions um, and they, you know, they're, they're doing the best that they can, you know, given the circumstances that we live in. Um, they're not happy with the rise of Islamophobia um, in their communities and across the country. Um, one person who was, you know, drastically impacted, and when you read the book, you'll, you'll hear her story. It's very, um, it's devastating because she ended up losing her job um, and uh, is now, you know, terminally sick for, for life um, and has to be on medication for seizures because of the stress that she endured by her, uh, you know, by her um, board, her school board. Um, she is now in a good place. Um, she's doing professional development um, for uh, youth programs. Um, but like I said, all of them, given the, the current circumstances of where we are nationally, um, you know, they are concerned with what is happening in the country. And I'd like to turn that same kind of question to Sabiha. In your work, have you found more anti-Muslim forces to deal with? In, in my work, because uh, we have been preaching to the choir, uh, it has been uh, it has been an impediment. Uh, ever since the election rhetoric got heated in the summer of 2016, and soon after the election, when my husband uh, put out a call to the network, his network, particularly the Chautauqua network, saying, "Invite us, and we will come to your towns wherever you are in the United States, and we will give talks on uh, on Islam and about Muslims in America." Uh, the floodgates opened, and we, as as you noted, you know, we we've done hundreds of talks in so many cities, but we continue to feel that uh, it's the people who are willing to learn and have a thirst for learning and are open-minded and are pluralistic are the ones who are opening their doors to us. And mm -hmm. I wish there was a way to reach all those that we really do need right. uh, to reach. So right. that's been a limitation. So the people that most need it, least want it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I've had, I've had the opportunity to, you know, during my book tour, and which, by the way, Sabiha and I have ran into each other in the airport at one time, <laughs> which is so cute and funny. Yeah. Um, I actually spoke at Oakland University um, in, uh, in, in Michigan, and um, the driver who picked me up to take me to the university for the event was actually Republican. Um, lovely, lovely man. He, he didn't tell me he was, but I, I understood from his, you know, from, uh, from his political leanings, but he actually did uh, a search on me. He, he Googled my name. He found out about the book. Um, he knew my whole story. So in the one hour ride, you know, from Dearborn to, to, you know, Oakland University, um, he was very sympathetic and he's like, you know, this is so unfair what happened to you and you're such a great lady and the great work that you're doing. Um, and then when he was driving me back, he wanted to buy a book, but they ran out of books. So I actually had a couple extra on me and because I was just so, um, touched by by him, you know, having such interest, I actually gave him a book, and he didn't want to take it. He wanted to pay. I was like, "No, you're not going to pay." Um, and that was like the one moment that I felt, you know, I gave somebody the opportunity who would never have this opportunity to speak to a Muslim, learn about a Muslim, hear, you know, her story. Mm -hmm. um, so those are like the rare finds that you wish that you can come across more often. Right. Um, because I know that that conversation that we had in the two hour drive uh, probably changed his views um, on Islam and Muslims in America. That's such a great story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that just goes to show that you, you face to face, person yeah. to person, mm -hmm. yeah, the magic. Right, right. Any questions out there? No? Well, a final thank you to Dr. Debbie and Sabiha.
So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank yeah. you. And um, please join us next week for poet Judith Bowles and memoirist Larry I. Palmer. Um, and if you feel like dropping by either open mic Sunday evening at five or the writing contest award ceremony at 615, please do so. In the meantime, stay well. Hope to see Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Goodbye.